So hi and welcome to this webinar on the topic of teachers training and professional development on inclusive de education. This is uh, specially designed for teachers receiving refugee children and who are learning how to manage culturally diverse classrooms. So welcome all of you that are uh, listening all over Europe. I can see in the list that we, are, we have guests from all over Europe. My name is Per Kornhall and I will be your host and moderator today. This webinar is organized by the European Toolkit for Schools as a part of our 2022 webinar series. It is hosted by the School Education Gateway. The European Toolkit for Schools and the School Education Gateway are initiatives from and funded by the European Commission. Both the toolkit and the gateway will soon be a part of what is to be called the European School, Plat School Education Platform. So stay tuned for more information about that. Today's webinar will be four presentations, four short presentations. They will be divided into two sessions of two, two presentations each. And each such session will be followed by a brief panel discussion and a possibility for you to pose questions. So please use the chat function if you want to ask questions to any of the speakers or, or uh, in, just please propose those questions in the chat and during the discussions I will pick them up during the, those sessions. The first session will give us an insight and some perspectives on what Sweden learned both from the Syria crisis and how one now establishes support for schools and teachers in the current refugee situation and what we possibly, probably need to learn from this. And the first speaker that is with us is Monica Lindvall, who is a teacher and a teacher trainer that, among other things, is responsible for, for professional development initiatives, conferences, networks, and such at the Swedish National Center for Swedish as a Second Language at Stockholm University. Welcome, Monica. The floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Per. Uh, I would like to start to share my pictures with you so that you can follow me when I'm talking. I work for the National Center for Swedish as a Second Language, and I will briefly explain who we are and what we do. And you can see my email at the bottom. Uh, we are a national center, uh, and we are commissioned by the Swedish government since 1997. We are located at Stockholm University, but as the title say, we work nationally. We work all over Sweden. We are a center, which means that we are a resource and development center in the area of Swedish as a second language. And uh, added to that also learning needs of multilingual students. And we work with all ages from preschool to adult education. I think I could say that we are unique in Sweden when it comes to combined expertise within our area of responsibility, including all these levels um, from preschool to adult education. Uh, we are 17 working at the National Center and all staff at National Center have a teacher background and we also have a high knowledge of research within the area. Uh, especially Swedish and uh, Scandinavian research, but we also try to have an overlook what's happening in the rest of the world. We are a center that support improved conditions for language learning and knowledge development in all subjects. So ultimately it's a question about integration, I think I could say, about multilingual pupils opportunities for further studies and an active participation in society and overall when they are in Sweden. If we look at the next picture, I will give you a brief, uh, just, just a very brief picture of Sweden as a country of immigration. Um, there are a few facts in this picture. We are almost, uh, ten, sorry, not nine, almost 10 million inhabitants in Sweden. 
and of those 9.8 million, 17% are foreign born. The biggest immigrant groups in Sweden are from, if we look back in history, since the 1950s, and include everybody from there. It's Finland, Iraq, Syria, Serbia, Kosovo, Poland, Iran, Bosnia, Germany, Norway, Denmark, Turkey, Somalia, Afghanistan, and Chile. And another number, and that's interesting to know, is that 23% of all children in Sweden under the age of 18 are foreign-born or with foreign-born parents. So in Swedish schools, we have 146 languages at the moment, or language group, as we say. And now we also have a new group, as we all have in Europe, a new group coming from Ukraine. So in the next picture, you have a few figures. Paula, can you change my picture? Uh, a few figures about Ukraine, and we are not sure about the figures in Sweden. We think that there are about 13,000 children, that means under 18, but they are not all registered, so there might be more. And those 13,000, very few, are registered in Swedish schools. And it has come to our knowledge that they continue in this Ukrainian school system, quite a lot of them, and they have teachers scattered all over Europe or left in Ukraine, and they have online education with the teachers. Uh, what happened when, when the war started uh, was that we had a very fast organization, both on a national level and on the local level, to receive the new migration from Ukraine. Because of the experience we have from 2015-16 in organizing uh, for newly arrived and for organizing them to attend school as soon as possible. Uh, many uh, more came in 2015-16 than at the moment because of the Syria crisis and the war in Syria, and we also had a lot of unoccupied children from Afghanistan. Uh, so the situation is quite different from them in many ways. But the organization for receiving them at school, we had the experience of. So we were fast both on a national level with the National Agency for Education as the central administrative authority of the public school system and also the National Center for Swedish as a second language. Uh, we have a lot of resources online that you can take part of, films, text, and also webinars that you can attend as a teacher and as a principal to uh, talk about how to do things. Uh, next picture will show you a bit about the legislation and the Swedish school laws. We have since 2016 a legislation about newly arrived, and this is just a shortcut from that. Uh, that was the first time in Sweden that we got the legislation to regulate education for newly arrived students in different ages. And the purpose of this legislation was to make sure that newly arrived students took part in regular education as soon as possible. And that is also what we have managed to do now, according to the legislation. Um, the legislation is also important to promote equality regarding reception and assessment of newly arrived students, and also to meet every pupil as an individual with different experience, different conditions and different needs. Uh, and this is the responsibility for all teachers in Swedish schools. I would like you to uh, I would like to explain to you about the situation where we have two Swedish subjects. And in the next picture, you will get that clarified a bit. Paula, are you with me? Uh, 
we have Swedish as L1, of course, and then we have another Swedish subject, Swedish as a second language. Uh, and the national center I'm working for is the national center of Swedish as a second language. So we have Swedish as L1 and Swedish as L2. We call it SSL to make it a bit shorter. Uh, this was introduced in 1995, that we should have two Swedish subjects. Uh, and uh, the Education Act states that pupils that have another mother tongue than Swedish and who needs, is the expression in the legislation, who needs Swedish as a second language, should be able to have that in Swedish schools. So SSL replaces Swedish as a first language on a weekly schedule for these students at school. Uh, SSL has similar achievement goals and proficiency requirements as Swedish as a first language. And it renders as a subject, subject eligibility for studies on the next level of the school system, secondary school, and also going to university in Sweden. So it's two subjects that are equivalent. Uh, SSL holds a place in the national curriculum and has its own syllabus and with explicit goals and knowledge. Um, so if you arrive from Ukraine now, you will have SSL and you will go to an introduction class uh, on different levels, depending on your age. Uh, you're also entitled to mother tongue tuition and study guidance in the mother tongue. Uh, this is uh, the law since uh, 1996, but as you can imagine, we have a great problem finding mother tongue teachers and study guidance teachers in Ukraine at the moment. So there is a great shortage. Uh, we try to find them online uh, or in many other ways, but uh, so far there's still a great shortage. Uh, this goes to the next bit, and uh, if you arrive, you should learn. Oh, please stay at the other picture, please. Which, if you write to Swedish school, you learn Swedish, of course, as a newly arrived, as a beginner. But at the same time, you also learn in Swedish. So L2 teachers, SSL teachers, but all other teachers, as I mentioned before, are responsible for the language and learning in Swedish schools. And that takes us to something called CLIA, CLIA. And I will explain in the next picture what that is. That's something I've been working with and my colleagues has been working with a lot since 2015, 16, when, when we had the problems in Syria and the unaccompanied children from Afghanistan. Uh, CLIA stands for Content and Language Integrated Approach. Um, or you could say Content and Language Integrated Teaching and Learning, if you want to. And I will read from, from this picture. Teaching in various subjects cannot be postponed until the student has a perfect command of the Swedish language. Parallel learning of Swedish and of other subjects is needed to enhance the learning of all subjects, including Swedish. Teachers should support each student in developing language proficiency in every subject. So that means that, uh, for example, the chemistry tree teacher teaches chemistry, of course, but also make the students aware of, of the subject vocabulary and on, for example, how to write a lab report and how to read a chemistry book, what's typical for the text in the chemistry book. So it's a lot of scaffolding, language scaffolding in each subject. So teachers in all subjects need basic understanding on how learning takes place from a second language acquisition perspective and content and language integrated approach, CLIA. 
uh, to subject teaching must be embraced by all teachers, regardless of the subject, so that the students are offered opportunities to develop the knowledge of the language side by side with all the subjects they are entitled to study. Uh, when I work with teachers, as you will see in the next picture, we have been doing that since 2015 a lot. We go to different regions in Sweden to develop together with the teachers and the school leaders how to work with CLIA and how to make it able for multilingual students to learn Swedish and to learn in Swedish at the same time. Uh, the schools have to develop a lot in the different regions because we, we focus on language across the curriculum and we try to make for all teachers the subject knowledge accessible and we have a high challenge for subject teachers to do this. Uh, we always work with a whole school approach from preschool to education so that the students when they go from one level in the Swedish school to another can recognize how teaching is done and they will get the same scaffolding and it shouldn't matter what age they are on, what level they are on. Uh, we work with combined initiatives at several levels so that a, a region and the schools in that region get a sustainable school development uh, that comes to the students. Uh, we have a tailored in-service training, so a region with their schools can come and say, we need this, but we also collect a lot of facts that we analyzed about the situation and about the needs, and then we tailor it. So it's always different in different regions, depending what students they have, what ages, what languages, and uh, the language background and the students' background when it comes to education, of course. Uh, we work with and make informed pedagogical choices. We are evidence-based and they work with evidence-based instructions. And we are focused a lot about the teacher agency so that the teachers can develop uh, from their individual, but it's a professional learning for a group of teachers or a school with all the teachers. They work, uh, we give them a lot of input. They do a lot of observation. How is the teaching now? What are we going to change? And they, they follow that up and do more observation to see the changes and to see if learning for the multilingual students are getting better. They share a lot of new experience. They have a lot of meetings where they talk to each other and learn from each other. So it's a lot of, um, learning from each other and the principals, the school leaders take part in this. I would like to finish with a quote. If we go to the next picture, uh, that summons up what I've talked about. Uh, it comes from the Swedish School Inspectorate and the National Agency for Education, who did a, quite a, a large research on newly arrived students and students with another, mo another mother tongue than Swedish a few years ago. And this research can be uh, summarized like this, and also the way we work can be summarized like this. It is the necessity for the entire staff body to share the responsibility for the learning and well-being of newly arrived students. The general approach that these students are the concern of the whole school is seen as a foundation for success. Another important factor is that the pupil is met with high expectations in all subjects. And with those words i say thank you thank you monica for this uh, we will we will continue directly to to gunilla our other speak, speed of speaker from sweden uh, and and come remember to to um, write down your questions in the chat and i will pick them up so 
Welcome, Gunilla. You are Associate Professor in Education and Senior Lecturer in Education and Special Education at the Uppsala University in Sweden. Please. Your sound is off. <laughs> we never learn, do we? Sorry, I, I was so into uh, getting my presentation <laughs> ready. Um, thank you, Per. And thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, webinar uh, and uh, to this very interesting and important topic. Uh, and uh, I will kind of continue where uh, Monica stopped because I will talk a little bit more about research and also uh, a few of uh, the research projects uh, going into this uh, area and how we've uh, researched within the school uh, and uh, research areas where we have little knowledge, at least in Sweden. So, um, oh, sorry. Ah, let's see. Sorry. Now, um, so the topics or the, the themes of, of my presentation as it was um, written in the um, uh, in the invitation was consequences for teachers, teachers training and professional development for multicultural classrooms. So that's the themes of, of my slides. And uh, I will also say a little bit of statistics just to contextualize the, uh, the situation in Sweden. And uh, after that, I will uh, give a few uh, um, information, a, a few slides about uh, two research projects, especially this one uh, about a multicultural um, um, research project in within a municipality with schools and classrooms. So that's my main focus during these uh, 15 minutes. Uh, and then also a little bit about how to connect this to um, a close by area about special support and inclusion, of course, uh, because we know very little about how to handle um, pupils with immigrant background and especially newly arrived immigrant uh, pupils. Uh, that also have some kind of difficulties or meet difficulties in school. So we've done a, a small, small research project about that, and we uh, we want to continue with that kind of work uh, later on. It's very little researched. And then I will finish with uh, three recommendations or maybe wishes. Uh, how to move forward towards a more inclusive school system for all learners. And a little bit about uh, some some uh, references that you can continue to uh, read my work in this area. So some statistics just to to frame this uh, presentation. So uh, Monica talked about this uh, huge wave in 2014 and onwards that we um, um, encountered in Sweden. And um, because of that, as Monica also said, we might be a little bit more prepared for uh, the Ukrainian pupils that are coming to Sweden. And this time when, uh, when we had this wave of uh, recently arrived immigrant pupils, uh, in 2014, it was very, um, it, it became, it, it came very fast and we were not really prepared and maybe the same for other countries in Europe. And as you see, 50% in uh, it, uh, recently arrived immigrant pupils increased with about 50% in Swedish schools during this time of, of uh, in during this time, because we've we've had multicultural uh, schools already before that, but this was it went very fast and many. So many municipals and schools needed to adapt their organization, education and teaching to new conditions in a very short amount of time. So in the municipality that I will uh, tell you about in a little moment, they had like they had to uh, 
transport barracks, like, you know, like uh, square houses just to move pupils into uh, at the street because they didn't have anywhere else to put them when they came so fast into the municipality. So it was very hectic for some municipalities. Not all municipalities took that many um, uh, refugees, but some did. And right now, after this wave, we know that study guidance in the mother tongue uh, is the most common uh, form of special support in comprehensive schools. Uh, so this is something that we really, really need to address. Uh, and I could go into this with uh, study guidance in the mother tongue. Everyone is um, entitled to that, but then if it endures in a longer period of time, it becomes a, spe um, a special support. And as you see, that's the, the most common special support in Swedish uh, compulsory schools. And also another uh, important and urgent uh, task is to, to increase um, the eligibility for uh, recently arrived pupils to be able to uh, go forward in the school system um, because uh, a smaller proportion of recently arrived pupils were eligible for national program in upper secondary school than their peers in the in this year of 2019 and 2020. So about 29% of the pupils were eligible for the recently arrived pupils uh, and at 85% of other pupils. Coming into the research project that we did, we, we me and my, my um, colleague, Monica Winterreck, professor at Dalarna University, and me, we were fortunate to get funded for a research project uh, in a municipality um, in, in Sweden that was just in during this per time period. So we we had the we were fortunate enough to have that, so we could really go into um, researching and studying what was going on in this municipality, because as the first um, point here says, little is known in Sweden how municipalities, schools, and teachers deal with possibilities and challenges in a multicultural, everyday context. What is going on in municipalities and in schools? So we researched both um, school administrators, uh, politicians uh, in this municipality, how they dealt with it, and also head teachers and teachers, of course. So our main focus was a school where 98% of the pupils were with foreign background, both um, before and, and recently arrived. So uh, they had a really multicultural school at this place where we were able to study this. So what we did during these four years, we were out in the schools, we observed, we had uh, lots and lots of teacher discussions and they also observed each other's, they read books about this and so on and so forth. And we also visited uh, the Lambton schools in London where they have successfully worked with um, multicultural schools to get inspired at this um, this school. And when we talked about how to present this, about what, hap what happens in the, this school, uh, the head teacher said, how can you ever tell anyone? How can you explain the, the, this context and what's going on in this school? Um, and the teacher said, this is nothing we learn at our university. Uh, we're not prepared for this when we come out. So uh, the teachers at this school, uh, they they needed to um, learn, and also the head teacher told us several times that uh, he and she they they needed to learn by themselves from practice, uh, from each other. So new teachers learned from more experienced teachers. So they were um, they were self didactic, out of the didactic, you can almost say, because um, in Swedish universities, we we weren't either prepared there to handle this. So um, we usually we I usually say that we we teach our teacher students for um, 
for some one kind of school, but not for this kind of school. So we are, we are a little bit behind uh, in the teacher colleges for this. Uh, and also what we, we saw in this uh, school was that the teachers were knowledgeable, but they weren't. They didn't recognize their own knowledge, and they couldn't verbalize it. So it was like tacit knowledge. Um, they they just did. And we helped them to see the fantastic job they did at this school. Um, but they they also talked about many many challenges. Um, they felt insufficient and they were constantly new situations that they had to deal with that arose in with the conflicts or different languages and so on. And uh, this is a very important point for me as, as working with challenges and inclusion and inclusive education and so on. They expressed that they had little or no backing from support staff either in outside of school or within school, like special educators and so on. So they, they didn't have much support from the support staff that you could expect. Probably, as I, I will um, tell you later, uh, because the support staff very often, they don't e have this um, knowledge either. But uh, just as a point, they, the head teacher and most of the teachers still stated that they liked the working at this school. So even with all these challenges, there was there was also a lot of possibilities and and um, feeling like you did something. Uh, you made a difference. But then some voices just to show the difficulties um, ar arising, uh, like uh, a teacher said, when we talked about that they had um, children with trauma, they, these were the, a school with children between six and 13 years old. So the teacher says, you don't, you don't, do not get to know how to work with a person who has trauma. No, I did nothing or there is nothing I can do. So even if, if I mean, they, they knew they shouldn't work with them, um, with the psychological part, they should work with teaching, but still they didn't know how to teach. Uh, they didn't, they had no uh, training in that and they had no support. And another teacher said he had these because I talked to the special educator. It is an adaption disorder. Was it called? And what would and that would pass in three months? So they are like um, without any, um, uh, they have no uh, no tools to work with this with th through education. And that's severe, I think. And then the head teacher said there are a lot of con conflicts between groups in the school, but when you read about the world and the world uh, situation and so on, that's right. I think I can recognize that and what I know is going on in the world so I can see that in my own school. So and um, that's why I wrote this where the world moves into the everyday classroom. Uh, they have that the world in there. So uh, because it was hard to capture this, we've written a book that actually was printed yesterday. Final, so it's it's fina finalized. It's in Swedish. However, it um, uh, the idea is to help teachers and teacher students to be more prepared for the um, the you say the practice that they might uh, encounter when they come out because they have very little of that experience when they are as teacher students so i could tell you more about that but i won't because i will just uh, take uh, two slides more and then i will finish so so uh, we'll see maybe i can uh, answer a couple of questions if you have about that so, uh, as I told you, I we've also done um, um, a study, uh, me and a doctoral student and a colleague, about um, about special educators and th their role in this. Uh, and it very little is known about the work of special educators related to this um, uh, the newly arrived students and, and newly arrived immigrant pupils with special support. Uh, and this is a result from a, a, a questionnaire 
with the special educators, 483. And what we see is that they they don't work sp specifically with um, the students and they have a rather categorical view. The reasons to school difficulties for these pupils are often, they say, individual shortcomings. So it's like they um, they don't have the the experience or the the knowledge how to work with this so it becomes the students own uh, problem uh, and that's not what they usually say with other uh, difficulties that they encounter so this this becomes different with this um, pupil group so and they also say that the uh, class and subject teachers and mother tongue tutors that don't have any formal education at all. They might not even have an education, are the ones that are providing the most support for recently arrived immigrant pupils with difficulties then in, in some ways. So this is my final, my final uh, slide. And then I, th these are my three wishes or my recommendations. We need much more research about uh, teaching and, and um, education within classrooms and schools uh, to, to know more about what's going on there. And we need more knowledge for all, all groups in the community. And of like this webinar, we need both more recognition of, of the both, both possibilities and challenges, and uh, we need to discuss it and make it open what is going on and how can we work with this because otherwise the this um, can uh, uh, can be a, a, a part of of school and schooling that we won't talk about and that they get double be, be losers once again so that's what i had thank you very much gunilla um there's a lot of, of thoughts in my mind, but I thought I would first leave the floor to, to, to Rosa. We have uh, one of our next speakers is Rosa, Professor Rosa, uh, and I lost your last name, sorry about that, Rodriguez Esquerdo from Spain. I thought, what, what do you think when you hear this, the presentations from Sweden? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to all. Uh, well, I think that we share a lot of similarities, a lot of uh, common challenges, and I have a couple of questions uh, for my colleagues. Uh, the yes. first one for Monica. I first congratulate you for your presentation, and my question is, what do you do uh, with uh, teachers or uh, uh, student uh, teachers? Uh, to prepare them to work from the clear click uh, approach. Uh, that is the awareness that uh, at a school, everyone is responsible for children learning uh, uh, Sweden, uh, Swedish as a second language and not just the responsibility of the language te teacher, of the special teacher and so on. And uh, for uh, Gunilla also, I congratulate you for the presentation. I think we share a lot of common uh, interests again. And uh, my question is, uh, what, do, do, what do you uh, suggest uh, to, uh, to have this uh, community approach in dealing with this uh, and not dealing with uh, immigrant background children as sort of special children but perhaps promoting good pedagogy and good teaching from an inclusive perspective to all, that it will also profit. Uh, of course, uh, immigrant with the, uh, children with immigrant background will profit as well. Uh, your wish is into action plans, so to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Should you start, Monica, with your question? Oh, the sound. There, now you can hear me. Thank you very much, Rosa, for your question. I don't work with, I don't teach teachers to be. I work with teachers in different parts of Sweden, in regions or in municipalities. Some of them have been teachers for a long time and some of them are quite new. And uh, as I said before, we really try to, to make them 
look into the needs of the students to make a local analyze in each school and in each subject. What do the students need to be able to study in the best way in their new language? And uh, then they have to talk about this. Uh, sometimes they work together, the, the teachers that have the same subjects. And we also divide that so they get uh, more information, but also get more inspired by teachers in different subjects. And then they, they uh, decide on what to focus on, what to start with. Is it interaction in the classroom? Is it uh, to scaffold reading or is it to scaffold writing? Or what, what, is, what is the most uh, important to start with? And different teachers can start in, in groups can start to work with different aims, of course. And um, it is a challenge for subject teachers to do this, uh, especially maybe if you work with uh, uh, subjects where you do a lot of things like art and music and, and subjects like that or sports, uh, but we have a curriculum in Sweden where you have to read and write even in those subjects. So reading and writing and interaction comes into these subjects as well. So that's my job, that's my challenge to try to get them interested and to find perspectives that they can work with. And uh, the methods I use are for all teachers, but um, what they use using the methods are different, of course, and also how to start and how to to move within uh, the subjects with with the methods they use is different depending on what subjects they they teach. But we see a lot of cooperation. Teachers learn a lot from each other. We we train them a lot to talk to each other and uh, experience what they have done in the classroom. And as we all know, what you learn most from is your failures, not your successes. So share your failures and go from that and try to improve and adapt so it becomes better next time you try to do this. Thank you. That was a long question, yes. Rosa, <laughs> but I hope you understand how we work to yeah. involve all teachers and this uh, very inspiring work, but also sometimes very hard work, of course. Yes, and now for, for, for Gunilla. Yes, I think it's a very relevant question, Rosa, and that uh, yeah, we, we struggled a little bit with that when we did our, my, my PhD student did this, because is it, should we, should we uh, make it different groups? Or what are we, what are we, we um, creating? then like categorization um, and and again we need to acknowledge this um, area but um, I know that we've we we will talk to a lot of the um, head teachers and teachers about the book and we've decided to, to use the title and talk about equality enough instead equality for all equality for all and then in a, in a, a changed uh, um, landscape school landscape so be more because I, I also listened to the webinar last week and i think uh, uh, the person from spain i don't know a, a male i don't remember his name and made a very good point out of that uh, and that we we should really think about the diversity uh, in itself and discuss that so i agree with you it's like a a, a, a challenge to to do this in a way that we really acknowledge what's going on, but still think that they are unique and and we need to address the diversity. Could we have a, a very very short answer to to one question in the chat before we we leave over to Rosa? There's uh, 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 the question is: Do the arrival of new pupils? into classes represent a break in the acquisition of knowledge of the Swedish students of that class. So is there any detrimental effect of receiving immigrant students in a classroom? Just a very short answer. For Gunilla or Monica, maybe Monica? I, well, I can only see positive uh, um, 
it's positive to for people from all over the world to meet and it's always positive to to have new students in the class and if you are well prepared it should always work and it should not be a break for anyone but it should just be a something that adds something to the, to the class or to the group and uh, it, we have a multilingual schools in sweden and we have a lot of multilingual classrooms and uh, we are a multilingual world i think so it's just positive that we can um, accept immigrants say that they are welcome and make them feel welcome and have the best resources for them Thank you. I think we will come back to that perspective when we talk about the deficits, um, you know, the deficit perspective that we often use on, on, on immigrants or newly arrived persons. Uh, I would say that this has been very interesting perspectives because in some way, Monica, you are sitting central and you're looking through your looking glass out in the, in the world. Uh, but Gunilla has been in the other end, researching the, the teachers. And you can see there is a, a uh, a kind of a mismatch between the descriptions that you give that is very interesting. Uh, and with that, I mean, I think that many teachers that Gunilla has met would have liked to meet you, Monica, if you get my point yes. there. And, but and we'll come back to that. Yeah, uh, the national we'll have to be very big. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to leave it at that because we need to give the floor to Rosa. We could talk about this so long, but we have to move on. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, Rosa, please, it's your time to present. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, and good evening or good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for having me here. I will share my presentation and I will be uh, sharing with you the results and the work we have been doing uh, in uh, a K201 uh, Erasmus Plus project titled Promoting Inclusion to Combat Early School Living. Uh, this is a, a strategic partnership for school education. However, interestingly, interestingly enough for me, at least as a coordinator of this PISA project, uh, we have uh, here a community of practice because not only we are from nine different uh, uh, sort of partners but also coming from seven different countries and it's interesting for me these nine partners are not only school teachers and practitioners but we have been working together as well researchers uh, teachers uh, university teachers and uh, two um, transnational uh, centers working one with uh, migrant education and the other one is a uh, professional um, Association, you might know it, uh, IAIE, International Association for School Education. So working together, uh, people interested in schools, in education, in combating early school living, but from different approaches. And as I said, uh, to me as a coordinator, uh, it's been very challenging, but I really believe in this sort of uh, uh, partnerships where we come together and do things together. Um, the rationale of the project is, of course, uh, to meet this uh, concern of the increasing number uh, numbers of uh, dropouts um, uh, in Europe uh, um, that uh, bring a lot of uh, challenges uh, for not only teachers, but also uh, researchers, parents, uh, principals, uh, headmasters, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is the reality that unfortunately, at least in some uh, countries, of course, more than others, and Spain is one of the of the European countries with the highest uh, percentage of dropouts uh, kids. Uh, we come together and we uh, analyze, reflect and do something from the school perspective, because uh, there is a lot of research from a sociological perspective and from an anthropological perspective as well to understand why this is a reality, but we have been working on uh, good practices or inspiring practices. The question uh, uh, behind the project has been um, how to make possible success for all and uh, how to learn or what can we learn from uh, good practices or inspiring practices, uh, practices that has been already are being already implemented in schools, which are sometimes 
in a very deep drive uh, areas uh, zones, but they get the, the best of students uh, for the students. So success for all is the the big uh, the big aim of the pro uh, of the project as i was uh, saying earlier from an inclusive uh, perspective of course uh, we know sociologically that there are some students like uh, the ones having an, a migrant uh, background that are among the the highest percentage of dropouts but also there are other uh, national and local students who are not able to succeed in uh, schools as well so we 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 look forward to success for for all um therefore the the concern is inclusion and the concern is also how to contribute uh, to the betterment of inclusive uh, multicultural or intercultural uh, training of teachers and the, the building up of uh, multicultural and intercultural schools, meaning schools who know how to go about with working with diverse children and not having these false ideas that we have a standardized sort of uh, children with a standardized uh, uh, only one language or one uh, cultural, religious uh, or uh, any sort of uh, background. But we have to to address uh, the success of all sort of children, especially those who are more at risk of uh, being excluded. Uh, therefore, in, in line with this, the specific goals of uh, PISEL of uh, this project has been to first identify uh, European good practices. We do not need to uh, invent the wheel. The wheel already exists. And as I said, there are teachers and schools who are doing well in uh, working from an inclusive intercultural perspective. Second, we have uh, uh, validated a system of indicators to identify good practices or uh, inspiring practices. So what are the, the common um, items that we should bear in mind? Uh, and of course, um, from research, we also uh, knew a lot of uh, this already, but we discussed with teachers uh, and together we came up with this uh, set of indicators to identify good practices in prevention of uh, school living. And uh, finally, we designed um, a course, a training uh, plan for teachers uh, to be more prepared to uh, to face these challenges that we have been working uh, talking about in the previous presentations as well, because as I said, they are very common sort of uh, challenges. So as a result of the project, we have come out with the uh, two main in, uh, intellectual outputs. Uh, I believe this presentation would be shared with all of you and uh, you can um, unload and uh, consult these uh, two uh, um, uh, products uh, in, in our website, which would be at the end of my presentation, and you would have these links. The first one is this uh, identification of good practices. This uh, we call it a toolkit for teachers on inspiring practices and the set of indicators uh, to also use it uh, in a reflective manner uh, to uh, reflect on your own practices. Uh, I, I would say this is the, perhaps the main contribution of the first uh, intellectual output. And the second uh, one is a course. It's a course with a set of units, and I will be talking more about this course, uh, which are the units and how we have a sort of uh, uh, thought of these units uh, from a didactic uh, point of view. In the project, we have had uh, two uh, main uh, activities. Therefore, one has been a blended learning activity uh, uh, where Jose has participated. So it's uh, this course that we uh, designed was uh, tested in a way that teachers uh, in practice and, and also uh, in-service teachers and pre-service uh, teachers did uh, the, the online part of the course. And later we had uh, a meeting in Prague uh, in uh, December uh, 2021 uh, to test and to share about the, the usefulness of these units. 
And the second, uh, talking more about this uh, uh, learning activity, which is uh, also part uh, at the end of the course, we thought of five units, like, uh, sorry, four units finally, uh, four main um, topics uh, uh, that uh, teachers should be very clear in mind. The one is about inclusive schools. We have been talking about inclusion, I think, uh, till now. What does it mean, uh, inclusive schools? How to build uh, inclusive schools? Um, how to change the culture of schools and the curriculum of schools and the methodologies of schools that we build uh, uh, inclusive, uh, more inclusive schools? The second one, moving away from deficit perspective. I think this is a key unit in the in the teaching of uh, teachers, the understanding that having certain uh, certain sort of students in our classrooms will lower the standards or will uh, damage uh, the the acquisition of uh, uh, competencies uh, to other uh, children. And the third uh, unit is about uh, working uh, with the communities, uh, working uh, with parents and working uh, also with uh, some uh, living forces that might be in the territory where the schools are placed in, like NGOs, municipalities, uh, and working from uh, the perspective of uh, funds of knowledge. Uh, and the fourth unit is about methodologies, innovative methodologies that can be very varied, uh, like um, service learning, uh, problem based learning, uh, et cetera, et cetera, hundreds of uh, mm, active methodologies, but without the understanding of uh, the other uh, three modules or units might not be just only uh, about methodologies. In each of these uh, units, uh, there is all uh, uh, always a sequence. Um, in the in the course, you find a reflective moment, some materials in uh, in uh, maybe um, webs, uh, videos, articles, uh, tutorials, etc. Uh, the second is uh, a reflective uh, moment, uh, an, an activity to do something like sort of an assignment uh, that already invite teachers to do little experiments or little practices in their own uh, classrooms. And the third one is sharing, sharing with others because we believe that we learn, uh, learning is a social activity. Always you find these three uh, steps in each of the four units. This is how the, the course uh, looks uh, like. It's a conventional, uh, Moodle course uh, with the uh, different units in the different languages of the of the project: uh, English, Spanish, Croatian, Italian, um, etc. And the second activity is going to take place uh, in um, in the month of June on the next month, second of June. Uh, you are invited uh, uh, for this activity because it will be on a streaming and it will be uh, the multiplier event where we will be sharing a little bit more in depth about the results of the project and about the uh, these two outputs uh, or two uh, materials that I have uh, presented very uh, shortly uh, and uh, uh, briefly uh, just now, uh, uh, so it will be in, in Seville, but it will be on streaming, so you can have more information about this uh, uh, materials and uh, the multiplier event in the in the web, uh, in the project uh, web, uh, PSELS, uh, well, the, the link, you find it there, and you can always contact me for further information and interest in, in what we have done. Thank you very much for your attention and congratulations to, to all of you to be here on a Friday after a long uh, week uh, interested on, on our work and reflecting together on how to better uh, education and uh, educational systems. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, it was also very inspiring and interesting to listen to. We will go directly now to the last speaker, who is a person who is actually uh, actually teaching on the floor in a school in Sevilla in Spain. I hope you are there, Jose. Yeah, hello. Yeah, thank you. Good to see. I, I couldn't see you, so I was just, you know, I was afraid you weren't there. <laughs> but but you are you are you are a teacher at the Malala 
this school in Sevilla, Spain, right? Yeah. Please take the floor. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you to, for having me. And then I would like to say that this is my first like presentation, my first webinar. So I hope to do it well. And well, I will share the, the presentation, but I will focus on the uh, last part, which is like the practice, the teaching practice. Okay, I will explain a little bit what uh, Rosa has already spoken about, and it's like the PISOLS like project. But I will focus, as I said, on the way that we have taken this to the classroom. Okay, as Rosa said, uh, the project is called Promoting the Inflation to Combat Early School Living. And well, the early school living, um, it's you know, like it's known as an irregular attendance or repeated absences and a justified education center. Um, minors of compulsory schooling age, I'm reading, um, but it's like, uh, this is like the problem that we can have. And as Rosa said as well, Spain is one of the countries uh, that have more impact uh, of this problem in the, in the schools. Here you can see like the number of the, um, sorry, the number of the early school livings, livers, um, like related to the European Union and it, we have to combat it. And we found that the inclusion can be like one of the most important things to work on. And then this, these four uh, factors can be some of the causes that we can combat. And one of them is the importance of the family atmosphere. For example, in my school, the Malala school, which is located in Mairena del Aljarafe, Seville. And it, the families have a very important like role in the educative aspect. You know, like they, they really, are invited to almost every aspect. And even, you know, like COVID situation has, um, has had an impact in our, in every schools actually, and well, actually in the society, but it's like, we are opening the school again. And I think that this is very important. Um, then the space of study that they had, like, you know, like some of them don't have, some children, some people don't have, a uh, very, you know, like appropriate mm, place and space to 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 develop their capacities and and this is a very important point. Then one of the most important point for for me is the bullying uh, that we have to take into account that we will and we will see it um, later. That is something that we worked as well in the in the formation of the of the course that, that Rosa has explained. And then the attention, the attention in the school that I don't know how is that one of the of the people who one of the persons, the people who who was um, like attending the webinar has asked something about the amount of children that we have in the classrooms. In Spain, the average number is 25. So sometimes this is a very, like a very hard problem to solve because the attention in the school is very related to this. Well, we're, we're moving to the online formation that we had in PISELS, um, in PISELS project and the, the units that we worked on. Uh, which are attention to diversity in educative centers, walking away from the deficit perspective, inclusion against exclusion, and then innovative methodologies focused on the potential um, bullying and early school living. Well, we worked on these aspects and the way that Rosa explained with divided into the three parts, which were the, um, you know, like the theory, let's say preparation, reflective, and then we moved to the second part, which was like doing an activity and like a little project, something like uh, a work. And then the third part, which I think that it maybe is the richest part is the, 
the the sharing of the perspectives and sharing opinions because when you are sharing your experiences and your tasks and the way that you see education is a very good tool to to learn uh, and then we moved we went we traveled to oporto and we we had like four stages in general uh, which were those these ones that you can see in the presentation and the as i said for me the stage three was the richest one as well because when you discuss as i said and you see the reality of italy for example uh, or croatia which i don't know but italy maybe is closer to our culture in spain but croatia is i don't know like you can see the differences but the similarities as well one of them the most important or, or like one of the reflections that I, I really highlighted was that actually you, you could see that the most of us have the same problems, even when the cultures are so different. So this is, I think, one of the most important points that get us, you know, like involved in this kind of formations. Well, we have here like a little comparison that I'm not gonna uh, focus on this. And then, and now, what about my school? Uh, my school is located in a good social cultural area. It has around 600 pupils. And as I said, families uh, collaborate with the school a lot. It's located, as I said, in Madrid de in Seville, Andalusia, in the south of Spain. Despite of the comfortable situation we live, we need it to fight uh, this problematic. So uh, to, you know, like to combat early school living, but actually to, to highlight and to give importance to the inclusion, we used service learning. And this is um, the most important point. And this is when we're, sorry, I'm going to, to stop a little bit and, you know, to, to, to be more, specific because for us for our for our environment service learning is very important we found that this methodology help pupils develop several capacities but it's like mm, it is very important for them to feel that they are really involved in the teaching learning process so I, don't know, I will show you then, as Rosa said, the presentation will be uploaded, I think, and you can see the video, like, which it says something like learning, emotional, um, careness, and service learning. You can see, like, one project that my school developed and carried out, and you can see, like, the different projects that we worked on and the impact that it had impact that, that the projects had in the in the closest society that we live with then you can see as well the um, two of the activities related to the projects um, uh, that the school developed and carried out one of them is the COVID explained to people with special needs like you can see a little bit here maybe you're you are not going to listen to it because you are not going to understand it, I think, but it's like you can see a little bit. As you can see, some of the activities are more like more mm, focused on the sharing, you know, like the information and to make people conscious about the problem. Like the impact is in, like it has an, an indirect impact, let's say, but some of them like this one, which is collecting used oil, pupils got in charge in like, COVID, but in the, I don't know how to say confinement in English now, sorry, I forgot. But it's like when we were in our, in our houses, we, the pupils just carried out this activity 
to get the oil, like the used oil, and to give it a second chance, let's say. So yeah, you can like, you can go into it when you have the presentation. And then uh, here you can see, you can barely see the projects that we are developing now. And each, now we are changing it a little bit. Here it, it is um, divided into the, the years, but now we're doing it like two by two or, you know, like the groups, first and second are together and third and fourth, five, fifth, fifth and sixth, and these three, uh, which are the kindergarten. And then it's like recognizing the effort, which is very important as well for us, like, because service learning has different stages. And one of them, the last one is a celebration. And then like recognizing the effort is very important for them to make them participating, like really participating in the teaching learning process as the main characters. And then that's all. I don't know if you have any question that I can, I can answer you. And well, as I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, this is an interesting. It's also, I mean, uh, you're a bit, you said you've never done it, but it is was like you've never done anything else. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank congratulations you. Congratulations to that. That's very good. Um, I have a question. Like before, we get into details. I have a question for you, Jose. That mm -hmm. is, what has been, what has, uh, what kind of, how have, you, have have you, how have you and your colleagues benefited from the project, and what kind of role do you see for these kind of projects and for webinars like the one that you are in now? I mean, do you I have any reflections that... on that? Yeah, like, you know, I don't know how to show it to to all of you, the, you know, the benefits that this kind of teaching learning process has in the, you know, like the way that you can see the education. I don't know. Well, it's something that it's very important when you are a teacher here in the public education in Spain, you are moving, like you are knowing a lot of schools until you get your school. So it's like, this is even richer or even better because when I arrived to this school, I've lived before, like let's say different methodologies in schools. And when I came here, you see that pupils are very active. People like pupils, sorry, are very, mm, confident and they are very polite as well and this the last one that i mentioned is very important because i think that sometimes i i saw another question before which said something like do you do you think that uh the the arrive like the ukraine people arriving no the new people arriving um can be like maybe like a bad thing for the I don't know, I, I'm trying to remember it, like about thing for the sweet, Swedish um, uh, pupils. And it's like, because of the contents, you know, like sometimes teachers are all the time thinking of the knowledge and like if, if education is the trivial game, you know, like the trivial, and it's like, this is not about education. Education is a lot of more, you know, like we are, building citizens we are not building machines you know like you you have google you already have google you don't need to know this is my opinion obviously like you don't need to know what's the highest mountain of america to be like a good citizen maybe you need to have the tools to help people to communicate with others to be part of a community and maybe this is the most important thing for me that that's why i'm here you know i don't know if i answered your yes, question yes or... yes you did <laughs> you did in many ways and you lifted on uh, and you were also touching up about, about on the on the question that i i i'd like to ask both you and rosa because you both mentioned in your presentation this deficit perspective that we often have on 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 new uh, newly arrived we, we have them in our societies but we also have it in our schools so, so please if you could 
uh, both maybe Rosa could start and, and we come back to you, Jose, uh, okay. or, and also of, of Monica, if you're still with us. Maybe we should start with Monica because you're still with us. Do you have any idea around that? Well, um, we talk a lot about uh, the, the physical perspective, but every student, and no matter if you're multilingual or whatever, should be met by high expectation in school and should be met by high expectation perspective by all teachers. And maybe when it comes to, to newly arrived children, that's even more important because they, they face so many difficulties in being in a new country with a new culture, being in a new school with a new school culture. Uh, so high expectations is very important. I think maybe a lot of you have seen this picture that we use sometimes with the little cat looking into a mirror and what the cat sees in the mirror is a big lion. And I think that's a very good picture that shows the high expectations and how we should regard uh, newly arrived students uh, when we talk to them and when we teach them and uh, whenever we try to in include them in, in our school systems. So I have to say goodbye, Emma, unfortunately. So I will try to listen to, you. to the rest yeah. of you. And Rosa, back to you about the facets perspective, the facet perspective. Yeah, well, more than about deficit uh, perspective in negative, of course, <laughs> ne deficit. I would like to uh, to talk in a positive terms, and I think there is a whole strand of literature on funds of knowledge. I would uh, invite all the listeners here to just Google funds of knowledge and learn about this uh, very uh, uh, revealing experience in the in the border of uh, Mexico with uh, with the states, which is basically recognizing that every child and their families uh, are fans of knowledge. They have knowledge. Uh, so it's uh, perhaps in the line that Jose was trying to uh, to share with us. Uh, what is knowledge? Knowledge is not only um uh that thing that are on books but knowledge is also uh, experiential knowledge uh that uh, immigrant uh, uh background children and their families got a lot uh, knowledge is about having uh, competencies in different languages even if for us their languages are not the main strand uh the mainstream languages so is basically uh, changing our our mindset uh, and looking at the children, any any child and their families as a potential careers of other knowledge that also need to be integrated in uh, in the standardized uh, curriculum. So um, I would just uh, more than insist on the negative impact of having negative uh, uh, perspective or deficit uh, perspective, uh, finding more about these funds of knowledge, uh, positive recognition of uh, diversity and different uh, backgrounds uh, in terms of uh, uh, language uh, or religion or um, uh, geographical uh, uh, place where they come from. So there is so much to, to learn from them and from where they come, rather than just thinking that they rest, they, they add value in what they already uh, contribute and have in their in, in themselves, in their vital experiences as well. And that is also from society perspective, extremely important because I mean, when people come to our countries with, with that kind of knowledge, with knowledge of other languages, knowledge of other cultures, knowledge of other nations, that is actually something that our societies can, can if I would be really, really, you know, uh, what could you say, capitalistic about it. <laughs> it's something that we can make money out of. It's something that we can make our countries richer of, both in terms of culture, like we can see in Sweden that many foreign born or foreign with parents from the foreign countries, they are now very, very interesting authors in Swedish in Sweden because they have a broader linguistic palette than others. 
but they can also establish you know business relations with countries with knowledge with that language knowledge so there is a richness that we have to be it's not a deficit i mean it's a richness it's another knowledge and we need to to you know to make sure that we use that also in schools but back to you jose what's your perspective on well for, um, look my like the the project that we are you know like developing in my year i'm a teacher as well and i'm teaching second primary you know second primary which children are seven or eight years old the project is called an uncertain trip i don't know if i said it properly in english but we are we are working on refugees and we are working on immigrants as well and you know like then specifically for them when you know they they are not like they have not they don't have sorry like a good perspective of this kind of things mm, but it is very you know it it's surprising when you see them building the empathy and developing some as rosa said you know like their bags are full of tools and I'm sure that my class, for example, is totally prepared to receive an an Ukrainian Ukrainian boy or girl. You know, like because they we we worked before, we worked in advance. And I think that this is very important. We don't sometimes we don't prepare them to be like normal citizens. We prepare them to be good people to remember, good people to write, good people to 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 read but sometimes it's like okay what do you really need in your daily life you know but i would like to highlight her if you allow me the important the importance of the resources as well because in spain sometimes as i said i don't want to be like negative but sometimes we need more resources especially personal resources in schools because otherwise it's very frustrating for teachers when you have like a lot of job to do and you don't, you know, you can't give them the, the quality of the education that they deserve. I think what the, the concerns that you raise is, is very, I mean, one thing is that you say that you don't have the resources and, and I, I, I would struggle to find teachers that around Europe that actually says we got all the resources we need but yeah. I, what i mainly take out also from your point you're saying that i think it's really really important is that you as an educator in spain just like like monica and gunilla also gave uh, some kind of examples of especially gunilla of the attitude of the the educators all over europe is that that you have this this central ethical dimension that you want to give every kid as good an upbringing as good an environment as you ever could and and that is not only in knowledge as you said it's also about how to relate how to build relations how to be democratic in your attitudes in your daily life and so on and so forth there is a strong strong i mean common ethics among educators all over europe to do the best they ever can to give all children in the classroom best ever you know experience of schools and that i think is a very very strong and important and a, and a common denominator we can see that we in the north and the south we have the same you know we have the same things to struggle with but we also have the same passion i mean the same passion for 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 teaching and for children i guess isn't that so and I think that is also something you learn when you meet people in other schools in other countries. You can see that they are culturally different, but there are values that we share. That is my experience at least. At least. So, Rosa, do you have any final comment before we close? Yeah, I, I just noted a couple of uh, things on the chat uh, to 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 move on from the deficit perspective to the benefit perspective we all benefit when we we move in and we live on diversity communities either at uh, schools or in general in society 
And the second is about, uh, well, remembering Freire. We are in the anniversary of Freire, uh, remembering this uh, attitude of uh, understanding, more than attitude, this understanding of teaching as a political um, uh, task <laughs> where we are obliged uh, to, uh, to uh, proportionate or to give uh, all students the best uh, quality and inclusive education that we can, trying to combine uh, excellent education or quality edu uh, education or teaching with inclusive teaching, not excluding that, uh, you know, like quality education is only education where, for example, bilingual uh, is only about English. Bilingualism is also about uh, children who speak other languages who are not considered uh, in the in the mainstream of languages as important, but they are because uh, every and each language is a heritage and, uh, and uh, comprises uh, uh, understanding of, uh, of life and society and so on. So yeah, it's a political issue uh, and <laughs> of course an ethical issue as well. Uh, this uh, duty that we do have to, to strive uh, to provide uh, quality and uh, inclusive education to all uh, children. Uh, of course, uh, um, migrant background children, but uh, I think we all other children will benefit uh, from whatever we provide to migrant uh, students uh, as well. That mm, would be yeah. my conclusion and my conviction. And, Perfect. Uh, Thank you very, very much. And and I think that this is very central democratic values. I mean, you said you're political, but it's a very, very broad democratical perspective. Uh, I like the term, the uh, moral imperative. They use that in, in Canada for school reforms, that, that actually we have a moral imperative. We need to build our schools inclusive. We need to make, give, a, it's a democratic imperative that we give every kid uh, as good school background upbringing that we as we can our common common children and it's also I think central for the European values uh, democracy values in the European Union. Um, with that, we have to wrap up this sem this webinar, and I want to say thank you so much to all that participated, all you who listened, and to to all our presenters. Also to the people who made this possible in the background, such as Aristia from the Commission, our friends at the Toolkit, and Paul and Alina from the European Schoolnet. I have learned a lot, um, especially the, the importance of recognizing the, the wealth of, of knowledge and resources that, that, that people that we think are strange brings to our communities and to our schools. And I hope we will be better at disseminating all that knowledge that that teachers and school leaders have around in Europe. Of course, I think we could be a, you know, a, a, a superpower in education if we join forces. So stay tuned for more webinars and all other resources that we have in the European Toolkit for Schools at the School Education Gateway and soon the new European School Education Platform. Lastly, I would like to say a thank you from us organizers, and I take the liberty to include the Commission, to all of you out there in schools in Europe who are now working to alleviate the effect on children and young people of the totally unacceptable invasion on Ukraine. You are always doing a fantastic work, but the current situation is, of course, a moment when many of us need to more, do more than the normal fantastic. So thank you all and I hope I will see, we will see you soon again. Thank you.